Excellent. So looks like we have some messy kitchen cleaners out there. That is wonderful. And our first trivia question up today. How many islands are in Indonesia? Today we're headed to Indonesia on our virtual field trip. How many islands are located in Indonesia? Let me know right now.
All right. Thank you for assisting there in the chat and let us know where you're watching from. If you haven't already, we had to go with a backup order quizzes game. I don't know where my new one I just made. I don't know where it went. It's disappeared. Technology is great when it works. With that said, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's virtual field trip. Welcome, everyone. Make sure you get logged into our new game code. And we apologize for that mishap. Let's do it. Komodo National Park, famous for the world's largest lizard, the Komodo dragon. But today, we're not coming here to explore the islands. Instead, we're headed to the Flores Sea. We're going to snorkel amongst some of the world's healthiest corals. We'll learn about this magnificent organism and learn about why you should care no matter where you live and how it farms its food. We'll also see some other familiar friends. All that and more on Learn Around the Worlds Under the Sea. All right, all right. Welcome all explorers. I'm coming to you live today from our studio in Portland, Maine. And you can see our live cam right now in Portland. And we have a uh, messy, uh, rainy day where I live. But where about you, explorers? Where do you live? As always, we want to remind you to think about your home. And, oh, there we go. And think about your home and where you live as we travel around the world, right? Do you live near a coral reef system? Well, we're going to talk about those and why you should care no matter where you live. All right, where I'm coming to you live today is known as the Dawnland. This is my home, and this place is called that because the sun rises every morning and hits the Dawnland first every single day. You may have heard of this land before by some of these younger names, such as Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine in the USA, and Southern Quebec, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia in today's Canada. But before it ever had any of these young names, and still today it's known as the Dawnland because it is the home to the people of the Dawnland, the Wabanaki peoples, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, and Abenaki peoples. Hey, explorers, whose native land do you live on on Turtle Island, aka North America? It's a fun activity to do if you've never done it before. Just head over to this wonderful resource. It's a website called native-land.ca. You can come here, use all the wonderful search resources and tools in the top left-hand corner, search your home or a place you're visiting on vacation, for example, and you'll get a big long list of links and resources to the local nations and tribes of wherever you typed in. And that's a great place to start with learning more about your home or a place that you're visiting. Hey, speaking of places, that's where we are. 
Today, we're headed to the Flore Sea. We're going to start off by snorkeling around this area called Pink Beach at Komodo Island. But first, where in the world is this place? Today, we're headed back to Komodo National Park. Komodo National Park is located somewhere in our world. Well, if you were paying attention during our trivia questions, it's located in Indonesia. Where is Indonesia Explorers located on our world map? I have highlighted a couple of sections here, A, B, C, or D. Where is it located? Uh, we had to use a backup here, and we're going to go ahead and let me know right now. We're going to check in with one of our on-camera classrooms since we are, I don't have a quizzes question for this one. Uh, let's go over and we're going to check out the audio for our first guest classroom. And let's go over to, oh, we got an upside down classroom. We'll figure it out. Uh, hi, can you hear me over there in North Carolina? Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. Where do you think on our map Indonesia is located? Is it A, B, C, or D on our map? Where do you think? What do you think, guys? A, B, C, or D? B. 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 Right. I heard some. I heard some uh, Bs. Also heard some Ds. And if you can't remember where I drew our uh, on our map. We had it like this, A, B, C, and D. And if you said D out there, well, you are correct. We are headed to Indonesia located in D. So let's talk more about Indonesia and where we're going today. All right, so this is Indonesia located in orange. They have some neighbors, Australia, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, and Malaysia. And today we're headed back to Komodo National Park. If you were able to visit Komodo National Park on our couple of weeks ago virtual field trip, you learned all about the world's largest lizard, the Komodo dragon, what this park is named after. But today, we're not talking about the Komodo dragon. We're headed to Pink Beach and to another island to go diving today under the sea. And we're going to learn what's in this national park in the ocean. The All right, welcome here, explorers. You can see here when we start looking around, uh, the waters are crystal blue and tropical here. So we're going to go ahead and start to swim around here. Uh, we are going to go ahead and give you a couple of questions here. So as a review, explorers, where is Komodo National Park? What country is Komodo National Park in? Let me know right now if you're playing over on quizzes. Right, we were looking for Indonesia there. Also, we're talking about coral reef systems today. We're actually looking at coral right now. What kind of organism is coral? This stuff right here. Answer right now on quizzes. What type of organism? What type of life is coral? Is it an animal, a plant, a fungus, or I don't know. Tell me, G.O.B., what is it? All right, we have a lot of guesses out there for plants, but if you're one of those few people out there that said coral is an animal, you are correct. Virtual high five goes out to you. Yeah, that's right. 
These right here, this organism, this is coral. This is an animal. And we're talking about this coral reef system today that we find in tropical waters all over the world. So there's many different kinds of species of coral. We're looking at different species of coral right now. So when I say different species, just like a moose is a different species of deer than a white-tailed deer is different than an elk is different from another one, right? Same thing here. These organisms are different animals. So this is a different animal than this animal right here. And I know it looks like plants, but it's because these are polyps that attach themselves to a hard object. So let's talk about that more in depth. What are these corals? So corals are animals, as we just said, and they're polyps. So you may be used to a polyp. Think of a jellyfish. You know how a jellyfish floats upside down with its tentacles down? Well, let's flip that upside down. And that's what we need to think about when we think about coral. So when we look at these corals, these are hard reef corals. There are hard corals and they're soft corals. And when we look at these coral structures up close, corals actually build themselves a home. And in each one of these tiny circles that you see here, not the tiny, tiny circles, but the larger circles, is a coral polyp. So when you look at a reef structure, a uh, bony, uh, sorry, a stony reef, so you can see here, one, two, three, four, there's going to be individual animals in there. So our story is getting even more complicated. Not only are we looking at different species of animal, but we're looking at different communities of animals. So when we look at coral, what we're actually looking at is many, many, many communities of coral polyps. Remember, I gave you the example of the jellyfish. Instead of floating like this with your tentacles down, well, we're upside down with our tentacles up. So inside a coral, so just like a, uh, a you may find a, a clam shell or just like you may find a seashell on the beach. You know how some ocean animals, they built a shell. Right. And what they do is they take calcium out of the water. It's called calcium carbonate. This is a mineral. Minerals are the hard, small things on our planet. Our rocks are made of minerals, by the way. And there's minerals in the ocean water. And calcium is a big mineral found in ocean water. So many of your seashells are actually made of calcium. So animals take that calcium out of the water and then they build their hard shells. Coral does something similar, but instead of carrying their big shell around with them, they make their home, they make a big shell, if you want to think of it that way, and they live in these homes. So that's what corals are doing. And these corals, the actual animal themselves, are soft-bodied polyps. And they come up, and they come out of their holes, and they feed with their tentacles. We call this filter feeding. That means they can't go out and search for their food like some animals can. Instead, they filter the water. That means as the water, the ocean currents float by, any uh, plankton or other particles of food that they can eat, they're going to grab with their tentacles as it's coming by in the ocean currents. And then they bring it to their mouth in the center of the coral polyp. But did you know this is only accounts for about 10% of their food? That's right. Only about 10% of their food they get from filter feeding. Where does all their other food come from? Well, their other food comes from farming in a way. What do I mean by farming? Well, uh, they have this algae that actually lives in the flesh of the coral polyp. And this algae is called zooxanthellae. You don't have to remember that, all of our younger explorers out there. It's a big word, but it's a fun one to say, zooxanthellae. Can you say zooxanthellae? Awesome, zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae is an algae that lives in the tissue. Imagine algae living in your skin. What does algae do? Algae produces its own food just like a plant does. So for those of you that said you thought this was a plant, well, you were completely wrong, right? Uh, it's not a plant, it's an algae, and an algae goes through the process of photosynthesis, just like our green plants on land do. So they take sunlight and through photosynthesis, they produce sugars or food. And that zooxanthellae is doing the exact same thing living inside the tissue 
of those coral polyps. So when they produce food from the sunlight, photosynthesis, all that extra food that they produce that they're not using gets used by the coral. How awesome is that? So they have this wonderful relationship with one another. Remember that word, relationship. We're going to come back to this in just a little bit and talk more about it. But first, let's keep swimming around and talk a little bit more about corals. So there's different kinds of corals found all throughout the world's oceans. Usually, when you think of tropical corals or reef-building corals, you're going to find them in tropical areas. So these are warm waters, and they need very specific conditions. What do I mean by that? They like clear water. They like warm water, not too hot, not too cold. They like a, a specific temperature range. They like uh, clear water. So you don't want it too cloudy. They like a specific type of salinity. That means how much salt is in the water. So they're really, really finicky, meaning they, they really like really specific conditions to live in. And it's not just the coral. It's that zooxanthellae. Remember that word relationship? This very important relationship between zooxanthellae, the algae, and the coral is extremely important. Why is it important? Well, unfortunately, you may have heard of something really bad going on throughout the world. Has anyone ever heard of coral bleaching? You may have heard of this before. What is coral bleaching? This is bleached coral. Look how different it looks, explorers. It is void of color. There's none of that beautiful tropical colors in here. So what's going on? When coral bleaching occurs, we have something that changes in the conditions, either the water temperature, how much salt is in the water, uh, how much, um, uh, how much uh, turbidity, meaning how clear the water is. So you have a change in conditions that the zooxanthellae, that algae doesn't like. And that algae says, I'm out of here. And they leave the coral polyp behind. And that's where the color actually comes from. So where you see all these beautiful colors in that coral is from the algae, the zooxanthellae, that stuff that's taking sunlight and making food inside the coral. So what happens is now you have these animals left here with no algae when it bleaches. If that happens just for a short time, they can recover. It will be okay. But if they go too long without zooxanthellae, they're not gonna, they're gonna starve, they're gonna get diseased, the corals. These corals will eventually die. This is happening all over the world, and not just recently, over the last few decades. In the United States of America, the coral reef barrier reef, our only one in the Florida Keys, is 90% of it, over 90% of it has already died. So this is an extremely big problem. Right? Why should you care? Right? So you should care because many of our uh, fish that we, our ocean uh, seafood that we love to eat, many uh, fisheries start off life in coral reefs. So juvenile fish, that means baby or young fish, they grow up in coral reef systems. Um, it's also very complex, right? It's very diverse. What do I mean by that? There's so many different types and flavors of life here way more than you'll find in a rainforest on land. We typically think of rainforests being very diverse, right, uh, habitats. Well, coral reefs are so much more diverse, and partly because the oceans, the life in oceans are so much older than on land. And we can find cool organisms around. Anyone ever seen one of these? This is a sea cucumber. Sea cucumbers are echinoderms. It means they have five body parts, uh, we'll see some other echinoderms here in a second. They also sometimes have a relationship uh, with a small fish called a pearl fish. Pearl fish, they'll uh, swim and back up in the, uh, in the uh, exit hole of the sea cucumber, and that's where they live. They have a relationship with one another. One organism provides the home, and another organism helps uh, clean up around the home. So uh, when we go around and we look in corals, we find other organisms as well. Does anyone see an organism here? Let's get a little bit closer and see if you see it yet. This one is a master of camouflage. Do you see it yet? There it is. All right, so this is a common reef octopus. Octopus are amazing. Octopus are what's called a mollusk. 
Mollusks are things like clams. Um, there are oysters, uh, uh, octopus, squid. They're soft-bodied, and they typically have a shell. Remember we talked about building shells before? Well, I've never seen an octopus with a shell. Well, they've kind of evolved out of their shells. Uh, they don't build shells anymore, but they do have a hard beak, if you didn't know, and their lens on their eyeballs. They have really big eyeballs, so they can see really well. And so they're really masters at camouflage here, and they can squeeze in anything as small as their beak. So as long as their beak can fit through a small space, their whole body can be squeezed through that space. You may have even read stories or, or, or heard about octopus actually uh, escaping through aquariums that, uh, because you can't lock them airtight, they'll squeeze through that little uh, slit to get out. It's really amazing what they can do. So part of the way that they change colors is really awesome as well. In their skin, they have what's called chromatophores. Right? This is a great way for camouflage because what they can do is they actually can change to look like the different various colors on the reefs that they're in. Now, when they're out hunting, because they're predators, when they will uh, do what's called a parachute attack, so they'll open up and kind of land on a coral head, and they'll scare up lots of little fish out of there, and other predators, other fish will kind of come in and eat off of the uh, little fish trying to get away, and then there's bigger predators as well, like barracudas that will go off some of go after some of those larger fish. So you can start to see a theme here. It's all about relationships. There's all so many different kinds of relationships that you're going to find when you visit a coral reef system. Now, remember I said, why should you care, right? Not only because our reef fishes, but we have many different kinds of algaes, uh, all sorts of examples of uh, ocean life that is thriving because of coral reefs. Remember our world's oceans, right? When we want to say save the rainforest, did you know most of the world's oxygen is produced by the algae in the world's oceans, right? So the ocean is vital for our planet. So you should care even if you don't live beside an ocean. So what's going on, right? Why are all the world's reefs dying? Well, climate change is a big one, right? And that's going to be a big problem that's going to take a lot of smart people, way smarter than I, and it's going to take a lot of effort by everyone together. But I do think it's something we can be positive with, right? And it's something that if you want to take some steps, but if you want to take some small steps, if you ever visit a reef system yourself on vacation, if you get a chance to, be careful with the sunscreens that you wear. A lot of those sunscreens have very toxic chemicals that are not good for corals. So if you go snorkeling around corals, you want to make sure you use a reef safe sunscreen. This is something simple that you can do no matter how old you are, right? Climate change is big, big problem. We can all take steps, but this is a, a definite uh, something that you can do, right? What's cool here, I love this example. Remember I said these reefs, right? These are different uh, species. They're competing with one another. Look at this coral right here swallowing up. They're competing for space. There's so much limited space because these tropical coral reefs, they, like a, they need a certain water depth and temperature. So where they, you find them, there's a lot of competition happening between the different corals and other species as well. And you'll find many big species like, whoa, looky there. We have a cool sea turtle. So this is a hawksbill sea turtle. And sea turtles, they eat jellyfish. So if anyone's scared of jellyfish, uh, you should care about your sea turtles. Another thing you can do, you know, those little plastic grocery store bags, right? We always want to be very careful with those, especially in the ocean. Uh, they are big, big culprits for sea turtles choking because they think they're jellyfish and they try to eat those plastic bags. So we definitely never want to have a plastic bag in the ocean. You ever see one, take it out when you're at the beach. Uh, that's going to help your sea turtles. Sea turtles also will feed on sponges, right? SpongeBob SquarePants. Sorry, buddy. Uh, sea turtles will sometimes pred uh, predate on Sea sponges. Sea sponges, by the way, uh, we've already seen a couple. I point, I'll point some out as we go forward. Uh, but they filter water. They add nutrients and oxygen back into the water around coral reefs. So again, lots of different relationships and uh, between the different animals that we're going to find on our coral systems. <laughs>
All right, so let's go ahead and head over to our next dive site. So our next dive site, we'll see some different examples of some uh, additional animals here. Uh, but let's go ahead and head over. Now, one thing that you'll see uh, as you travel around in the Flory Sea, uh, what's really amazing is what is water glasses out here. That means it gets super flat. Almost it looks like glass. Whoa! Anyone know what these are? So these are related to that sea cucumber we saw earlier. They're in the same phylum and it's called echinoderms. So echinoderms have five body parts. And if anyone is shouting it out, these are called urchins or sea urchins. Now, if you've ever been to an aquarium, sea urchins are really fun because usually, in a lot of other echinoderms as well, like sea cucumbers, sea urchins, they're usually really safe to pick up, depending on the species, however. Uh, and that's why when you go to many aquariums, they'll be in the touch tanks. So they're really fun to hold, and you feel them walking around with their little spines, and it feels it kind of tickles in your hands. Well, you never want to touch one of these. If you ever see one of these out in the ocean, these are long, spiny black sea urchins. And their spines, instead of being really short and rounded, they're really long and sharp. And that means when you touch them, if you do, they can potentially break off in your hand, kind of like a splinter. But in the world's oceans, right, there's all types of bacteria and other things that can uh, give you infections, right? So uh, for several reasons, we don't want to touch our coral. We don't want to touch sea urchins here. We want to look, but don't touch, right? And so when we do that, that's going to help keep us and the organism safe. All right, so as we swim around these corals, you'll see lots of algae. Remember I talked about algae earlier? This stuff right here is algae, right? Algae is really cool. And it's not just that uh, gross, slimy green stuff you see in a pond, right? In the world's oceans, they float around. They're producing oxygen. Uh, they provide habitats for many organisms like brittle stars and uh, other organisms as well. So they're really super important to all of us. And then we have seagrass as well. Seagrass beds and algae, you'll find lots of this around coral reef systems. And again, you'll find many organisms living within and around these seagrasses. And <gasps> what's that? Oh, that is another echinoderm. Hey, I have another question for you over on Quizzes Explorers. So go ahead and grab your devices if you're playing along. Hey, do you know what this is? Well, many of you probably are going to call this a starfish. Is a starfish a fish? Let me know right now. All right, so we have some yeses and some noes out there. So a starfish is not a fish. So uh, a more accurate term would be sea star. But don't get too caught up in it. If you call it a starfish, that's okay. Uh, there's plenty of examples of animals. A seahorse, for example. Is a seahorse a horse? Of course it's not, right? A seahorse is a fish. This is an echinoderm. So it's, uh, it's not a fish. It's a different type of organism. These are related to sea urchins. They're related to sea cucumbers that we already saw, uh, sea dollars, for example, brittle stars. And, uh, and these are really uh, fun to talk about when we talk about echinoderms because classically echinoderms have five body parts. And you can really see that really well with a sea star, right? Those five distinct body parts on them. Now, uh, you'll find them uh, around uh, coral reef systems a lot here. You'll find many different species of sea stars uh, around coral reefs as well. So as we continue around, here's a, whoa. All right, so here's some little friends. Oh, they are very curious, aren't they? Look at them. Let's slow it down here. What are these, right? So you may be thinking to yourself, hey, find a Nemo. That's a clownfish. Well, kind of. These are false clownfish, so they're, they're related, uh, but it's not uh, the species clownfish. A couple of ways you can tell is uh, they have a, a, the black line in between the white and the orange is, uh, is very thin and hard to 
uh, see sometimes it's really thick on the clownfish. Also in their eye is extremely black. The clownfish has a lot of orange in its eye as well. But both of them, typically they're easy to confuse because both of them will often live in the same home. And this type of home right here, it looks kind of like and very related to our corals we we're talking about earlier. Remember the polyps that are attached to something hard and they're reaching around with their tentacles? Well, this is a similar animal in a way. These are called anemones. Remember Nemo saying, I live in a sea anemone, me, 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 right? So this is a sea anemone. Sea anemones have stingers. They don't need that protected home. Most animals keep their distance from sea anemones, right? But the clownfish and the false clownfish here, they are not affected by the stinging cells of the sea anemone. So the clownfish and the false clownfish here, they can live in a sea anemone and have protection from predators. However, right, they also clean up around the sea anemone. So the sea anemone likes having the clownfish and the false clownfish living in and around them. And the fish like living here because it gives them protection, right? Remember that word we've been talking about all today, relationships. I want to go ahead and give you a better, more scientific word. You don't have to remember it, all of our younger explorers, but if you do, big thumbs up to you and you'll get a lot of test questions in the future correct because of this, because this is a great vocabulary word to know, right? So our word of the day, explorers, is going to be symbiosis. You say symbiosis? Symbiosis is when two living organisms have a relationship with one another. Now, there's different kinds of relationships, explorers. So sometimes you have a relationship where both organisms are happy, like the clownfish and the sea anemone. They both benefit from that relationship, right? Oh, yeah, right? Uh, then you have some type of relationships where one is happy and one doesn't care. One's like, ah, I'm not hurt, but I also don't benefit from this relationship. An example in the ocean would be like a sea barnacle that lives on a well. Uh, a whale doesn't care about that barnacle. It's not harming them, but that barnacle gets a home. It's like, all right, I'm happy. And then we have another type of relationship. This is when another type of symbiosis, when one organism is happy, oh yeah, and one is sad. One is being harmed. That, a great example of that would be a parasite. So think about a tick. You ever get a tick hiking in the woods, right? You're not happy. You can get Lyme disease and be harmed in other ways from a tick. But that tick is happy because it gets all you can eat buffet from, sorry, you, right? So that is an example where one organism's happy and one is sad. It is not benefited. But all of these together, they're all called symbiosis, symbiosis. And that's what we find when we talk about the anemone and the fish, the different fishes that live within anemones, right? Same thing with the zooxanthellae and the coral. It's symbiosis. They have a relationship with one another. And uh, it's beneficial to both parties. You can see here, living in and around these sea anemones, they stay protected in here. And they will wriggle deep down into the sea anemone to stay protected from any would-be predators. Now, if you've ever been snorkeling or you want to in the future or go scuba diving and you want to take a camera with you down into the ocean, one thing you'll be surprised when you get your underwater camera photos back is often when you go deep in the water, all your photos come back blue. And why is that? Well, that has to do with the interesting behavior of color in water. That's right. What does light do in water? Well, light, remember, is made up of different colors. White light from the sun is made up of different colors, like red, green, blue, for example. And these colors get absorbed by light at different depths because light waves are different lengths, depending on what color we're talking about. So uh, you can review that with your teachers in your class if that is a, a brief introduction to white uh, light waves. Uh, but hey, what color do you think? I'll give you a hint. One of the colors of the rainbow, what color gets absorbed first by water when white light goes into water? Which color disappears first when you dive down deep? What do you think, explorers? You can let me know right now if you're playing along on quizzes. And that's going to be our last practice question today. <laughs>
All right. So if you said red, you are correct. So an easy way to remember this and easy way to remember your colors of the rainbow is Roy G. Biv. If you've never heard of this before. So Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violent. And as you dive deeper into water, you won't see red after about one meter, about three feet. Orange is the next color to disappear. Yellow is the next color to, to disappear. So you need to take lights down with you if you want to see all those different colors. You know what's really neat about this? Another example from Finding Nemo, remember the angler fish? The angler fish that uses light called bioluminescence, by the way, to draw in fish so they can eat. Well, the angler fish, many of them are red. The many deep sea, deep ocean animals are actually red because it's a form of camouflage. They are invisible that deep in the water because there's no red light making it deep into the ocean to reflect off their red pigment. All right. So again, we're not going to get too deep into it, but if you're wondering why your eye sees red, right, it's actually red light that bounces off that red crayon, that red pigment. And that's what you actually see, red reflection. The crayon doesn't give off red light, right? You're just seeing a red reflected light from that red crayon. All right, so explorers, what we're going to do, we're going to jump into our geo quiz here, see how well you're paying attention on our virtual field trip today. And if you can stick around in our post show, we're going to answer all your questions in a rapid fire session. So make sure you can stick around and we'll talk a little bit more about cool marine wildlife all right explorers let's do it if you are logged in let's go ahead and get started here's your game code if you don't have it already 182026 all right let's go ahead and get started with our quiz today first question up an octopus blends in with its surroundings using what All right, three, two, one, camouflage. We're looking for camouflage on that one. Great job there, explorers. Next question. You can remember the colors of the rainbow by using which of these? You can remember the colors of the rainbow by using which of these ways to remember? <laughs> We'll give you another three, two, one. All right, Roy G. Biv is what we're looking for. Roy G. Biv. All right, so Komodo National Park is found in which country? Komodo National Park is found in which country? All right, five, four, three, Two, one, Indonesia is what we're looking for. Great job there, explorers. And next question, coral is what type of organism? What is coral? All right. We're going to give you three, two, one. We're looking for animal. Coral is an animal. Great job there. And our last question of the day is going to be, when two organisms have a relationship with one another, that is known as what? When two organisms have a relationship with one another, it's known as what? We're looking for symbiosis, 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 three types of symbiosis. Remember that one. That will be on a future quiz sometime in your student life. All right. Today's winner. Oh, that was a close one by two points. Big parrots. You are first place. Look down at your devices. If it says you're ranked number one, you're today's winner. Congratulations. You're going to get a postcard from me, GLB, from the Learn Around the World studio. Not just any postcard. That postcard is made out of elephant poo paper. If you want to learn more about elephant poo paper, make sure you join us on Earth Day for a special virtual field trip to the Poo Poo Paper Park in Thailand.
All right, Explorers, if you have to head out, sorry about the late start today. I don't know what was going on with our quizzes, but feel free to head on. We are going to answer all your questions right now. Make sure you're putting those in the chat. We're going to start with our guest classrooms that are on camera with us, however, and we will check in first over in, we'll go North Carolina, and then we'll head over to California. All right. Do we have any questions over in North Carolina? Hi. Do you have any questions? Okay, Ethan, go ahead. I have a question. Ethan, come on. Right, come up to the camera and ask your question if you have it. Come on, Ethan. Okay. He's being bashful. Yeah, no worries. Um, how does a uh, coral get there at first? How does it get like where? Coral. Oh, that's a great question. So when coral is when the corals are juvenile, so when uh, when corals have their offspring, they uh, they'll float much like a jellyfish. So they'll float and then they will uh, find a place to attach to and to start growing. Uh, great question. So, uh, and that happens with, uh, with many uh, other sea organisms as well. Let's head over to California. And there we go. Do we have any questions over in California? All right. You may have to come up and either unmute or toggle on your microphone as well. And don't forget, if you are uh, with this in the chat, you can definitely add your questions there as well. A couple of shout outs earlier that we missed in Colorado, uh, Elon, North Carolina, Arizona's in the house, New Jersey today. Welcome, everyone. If you're still there, definitely make sure you add your question to the chat. We would love to get to those. Right? You may have to, on your browser, approve to say yes, so let it use your microphone. And then toggle on your gear, okay? And you can also type it in your box as well. How do sea turtles not get stung? I do know, I don't know specifically the science between sea turtles not getting stung by jellyfish. Uh, some animals, like we talked about the clownfish, they, they just aren't, they don't react to the stingers. Of, uh, it may have to do because sea turtles are reptiles. They have scales, uh, and pretty tough scales, and they have a hard beak. So when they go after them, and that would be my guess off the top of my head, uh, I don't know the specific uh, one there as well. Um, what is my favorite fish uh, that I saw coming from Eden over in our chat? Uh, so my favorite fish um, that that I've ever seen or I've seen in Komodo National Park, my Komodo National Park, I would say the false clownfish uh, was my favorite uh, just because I'm a big fan of finding Nemo. Um, that in a close second would be parrotfish, but I've seen parrotfish in other places. Parrotfish, they actually eat the algae that grows on corals. And so uh, parrotfish, they have very strong jaws and teeth, and they can actually chop through that hard coral. And it sounds bad for the coral at first, but they keep the algae uh, growth down that can cover up the corals and that's bad for them. So, uh, so it's actually good for them. In many of our white sandy beaches in these tropical locations, we can thank parrotfish for those because much of the coral they're chomping down and breaking down into smaller and smaller segments. They end up washing up and become uh, these sandy white sandy beaches uh, on many of uh, tropical islands and places that you may visit on vacation. That's pretty awesome. All right, uh, let's see. And Let's go back over to let's go to North Carolina. Do we have another question over there? How does the algae even get in the coral in the first place? How did the algae get in the coral, right? So they land and they get into they go through the the flesh of the coral. So the coral uh, has a flesh, it's a soft body. And they're able to work their way into the soft body. And Zoxanthellae does this with other organisms as well, not just corals. So they'll do it with some other soft-bodied animals as well. Uh, but coral uh, relies on them because coral uh, provides habitat for many other animals. 
and corals are so important to the world's ocean's health overall. Uh, it's a very big problem when that zooxanthellae is leaving uh, the coral polyps. Great question. All right, and let's go back over to California there. You may have typed it in. Uh, how do starfish eat and where their mouths? Ooh, that's an excellent question. So starfish, uh, you know how they have those five body parts, the five arms that are coming across? Their stomach is on the underside of the middle. Some starfish, this is really awesome, they'll actually predate, they'll, uh, they're predators. They'll actually feed on, say, like clams and bivalva. And what they'll do is they'll, some of them, some species will actually eject their stomach. So they're, they're, they'll eject the actual organism of the stomach into the clam shell and consume the soft body inside the shell and bring it back into the body of the starfish. How awesome is that, right? There's so much amazing different adaptations and marine wildlife. If you ever have dreamed about going to another planet, uh, this is the closest thing that I can possibly think of. I love, love, love going under the ocean. I love going scuba diving, going snorkeling, and it really is like being on a different planet. Remember, life started off on the planet in our world's oceans. They're much, much older, much more diverse than life on land. Even though life on land is very diverse, it's trumped out by the world's oceans. It is amazing. So definitely go out there and research. We're just touching the surface today. Um, let's see. What would happen if a person touched a sea anemone? So sea anemones have stingers, and depending on the species, it may be a little painful or a lot painful. There are certain organisms that you just don't want to touch because of the venom in those organisms. Um, some examples like fire coral. Um, there are other examples of worms. That's right, worms. Worms are beautiful. They're beautiful Christmas tree worms, feather duster worms that live in around coral. Some of them uh, have stingers on them. So you need to be really careful. You need to know what you're touching. The best rule of thumb is don't touch anything. Just look. And unless you know for sure, that's a safe organism to touch and pick up. And even if it doesn't sting you and hurt you right then and there, you may hurt it. Uh, some organisms have a protective mucus around it. And so by touching it, you can disturb that and you can make them more, um, uh, uh, more in danger of getting disease and sick themselves. So it's very important that you know what you're touching when you touch things. Uh, and so the best rule of thumb is just look and don't touch, right? So great question there. Uh, let's like our friends in North Carolina headed out. Let's go back over. We'll go back to California. You can keep typing your uh, questions in if you have that. Do octopi attack or eat sea turtles? I don't know if octopus uh, uh, attack sea turtles. Um, there are, uh, they do have predators. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of the um, threats to sea turtles unfortunately, are, are humans. Um, boat traffic that hit them, um, uh, trash, as we saw, being mistaken identity and choking, um, a bycatch from fishermen with just fishing with big nets. Uh, and so there's lots of different threats to uh, sea turtles. Uh, great question. Uh, let's see. Do we have your audio working? You're up there. I don't hear you, though. So you can uh, type in any other questions if you have them as well. Uh, why does the color disappear, red color disappear in water? All right, so uh, great questions. Uh, really brief way of explaining it, uh, if I can be brief. And let me just do a quick drawing for you. All right, so light travels in waves, okay? So this may be uh, for our younger explorers. You may not have gotten into this yet, but waves have different wavelengths, okay? So that means the top of a wave to the next top of the wave. So you go down into the crest and back up again. So one late wave length, right? Think about an ocean wave coming in. The more they're spaced out, the slower they are coming in, the longer the wavelength. If they're coming in really fast one after another, the shorter the wavelength. So light has different wavelengths. The visible light that our human eyes can see uh, are the colors of the rainbow. There are other colors, by the way, um, but we just can't see them. 
And so red has a uh, different wavelength than, say, blue does. And water absorbs different waves at different rates of different amount of water. Now, this happens in our atmosphere as well. Do you know why we see blue skies when we look up? Why, if you are on the moon and you look up, you see the stars in the sky? Why don't we see stars in daylight? Well, that's because blue light, when it hits, white light hits our Earth's atmosphere, blue light sh uh, scatters. And that scattering of blue light makes our skies blue in the daytime. Uh, also, when you see a red sunset or a red sunrise or orange sunrise, right, that um, what we're seeing is the, we're seeing, we're looking further where you are at. Say, if I'm standing here on the planet, uh, right here, and the sun's going down way over here, the Earth's spinning, right, we have to look through more atmosphere for that light to get to our eye. And that light travels through more atmosphere instead of coming straight down like at noontime. And when it travels through more atmosphere, those different waves are reaching our eyeballs in a different way. And we see uh, primarily those reds and oranges in this way. So light is super uh, a fascinating subject. I encourage you all to go out there and learn more about light, how it travels, how it goes around. You can get into ultraviolet or uh, uh, light, which we can't see on the violent end, or uh, our infrared light, which is really cool as well. All right. And, uh, and let's see. Do we have any other questions there? Starfish come in all different colors. Do starfish. Starfish do come in uh, many different colors, depending on where they live. Uh, lots of ocean animals. Again, uh, when you see a lot of those blues and things like that, uh, depending on what water depth they're in, they may, may, may be more camouflaged at some times than others. Camouflage works a lot differently in, uh, in our world's oceans than our land animals. One example is countershading. Birds use this as well. But fish, for example, will be white on their bellies and dark on their top. You ever seen a shark before? You look down on a shark, they're going to blend in with that dark blue water under them. But if you look up, their white bellies are going to blend in with the white sky from that white light coming in. Cool. And all right. So we have been running on for a long time. I don't want to take up all of your time today. And we only scratched the surface, explorers. I cannot express to you how cool the world's oceans are. Go out there. If you saw anything that excited you today in any topic that we talked about, go learn more about it. The world's oceans are awesome. And they need our help. So you can maybe research your ways to do your part. Until next time, it's a big world out there. So keep exploring. Bye, everyone.